Hi there, my name is Ari Gross, creator and writer of the one-shot sci-fi comic Awakening. You can also find some of my work in the anthologies Might and Magic and Monster and Laws and Fairy Tales from Mars, as well as Tales from the Cloakroom. You can find me on Twitter at Ari B. Gross, my website at AriGross.ca, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today on another interview on the show with a very talented and creative person. I've seen his work online multiple times. We are joined by the ever-talented Ari Gross, the creator of Awakening. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am a comics writer, a relatively new comics writer. I've started writing comics fairly early on into uh, the pandemic, spent about a year just writing stories, not having anything drawn or published, just, you know, learning how to do the craft of writing. It's creative writing was a little new for me. I mean, not totally new, but the first time I've done anything big like this. And then for the past year, I've been just kind of cranking out one short story after the other. I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight shorts, including one fairly lengthy standalone webtoon. I am releasing right now on Kickstarter Awakening, which is my first single issue comic. Comes with a backup story that was uh, previously published in another anthology, Tales of the Cloakroom, which uh, dovetails with Awakening very nicely. Yeah, I've just been super thrilled to get into writing comics. I've been doing it absolutely crazy. Can't stop, won't stop, that kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, just coming at you right now with a new sci-fi story that I hope everyone checks out. A great segue because we also had a lot of the creators and uh, editors uh, from Tales of the Cloakroom on the show last year, actually. So it's great to see the another connection to that amazing series as well. Yeah, it was really fun. And I mean, that's a huge part of my formative comic experience, I would say, is basically when I was writing, I was just by myself looking for, you know, how do I get into comics? How do I start doing this thing? And then I uh, signed up just kind of on a whim for Scott Snyder's uh, comics writing class. Mm-hmm. And pretty immediately after the class started, uh, some was like, hey, let's do an anthology. Uh, and they decided to make everything about the theme of the jacket, since Scott Snyder's uh, his personal publisher, her, his label, his branding is, she's not going to forget, My Best Jacket uh, Productions. Yeah, and Jacket is actually a portmanteau of his two sons' names just stuck together. It just looks like Jacket. All of her stories had the theme of Jacket. Somehow a jacket had to matter or come into the plot. For my story chosen, it was uh, a kid received a jacket from uh, sort of like galactically peacekeepers, a sort of kind of the equivalent of the Green Lantern ring. And the story just kind of goes from there. Uh, working with Chris Lawson, with uh, Aubrey Lynn Jepsen, who is the editor and letterer for Awakening, the other editors and the whole team, I mean, that's where I kind of like understood how comics is done, both as a collaborative process of working with artists and, you know, working with other writers and editors and just getting into a community. You know, everyone sort of has their first little community that they come up with, and this is mine, and it's been an amazing group of people. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to sort of like make my debut on the comic scene not just alone wondering what to do, but with this group of people, all of whom are supporting each other and all of whom have really great work coming out. And it's also transitioned in the fact that you've now written eight, nine comics yourself. Support is very hard to come by. Mentors are very hard to come by. You lucked out with an amazing community. So congratulations. I did, yeah. So let's talk about Awakening itself because from the brief images that I got to see as well too, thought it was beautifully done, colorful, Star Trek-esque vibes. So you've already hooked me with everything so far. Oh, good to hear. But, but what's the series about and why was this an important story for you to write? So Awakening, it's a one shot. I mean, there might be more, never say never, but I didn't plan it as a long series. I have other things I'm writing, which maybe I'll talk about a little bit later that are meant for ongoing series. But this was a story that I sort of had burning in my mind, probably about six months to a year before I ever even thought of actually writing it. I mean, that's what usually happens with me. I get an idea for a story. It sits in there. It develops into the point that I'm like, either have to, okay, sort of shit or get off the pot. Like, you're going to write this eventually. Maybe we're going to write it later. But what are you going to do now if you're going to write it or not? For the first single issue, I I can't remember what made me pick this one of all other ones. Maybe, I guess I just really wanted to do it. I like Star Trek. I'm not the Star trek Star Trek person in the sense that I haven't seen literally every Star Trek. Like, you know, some people in my family who are like, what, you haven't watched all of, like, Voyager, like, back-to-back in, like, three months like I just did, I was like, no, I have things I'm trying to do other than that. I really love the idea of a futuristic, scarcity, supportive, yay science, yay culture, like this utopian society that I think you can tell really interesting stories with. I love science fiction. I think science fiction is really one of the best genres, if you can call it that, or uh, settings, because I would say sci-fi usually is a setting for different genres. You know, let's say you have a horror genre, a horror type story, or a personal family story in sci-fi. 
but this is very much a almost like a very Star Trekky story where a ship at the edge of an unexplored galaxy encounters an anomaly. They don't understand what's going on with it, but it seems like it might be having a very strange effect on one of the crew members, Lieutenant Lau, the the green guy you've got in the over there yeah. in the corner with the antenna. Uh, he keeps turning as a as like comic device to the readers and is seeing something that no one else is seeing and is having problems communicating this and it's unclear whether or not this is a real thing, uh, whether this is something that's you know made up. What's the connection to the anomaly? So the mystery starts and begins there in a very sort of classic Star Trek like something weird is happening and then they have to deal with you know what is the weird thing. I like the story uh, a, a lot. I think it's really fun. I think people who are into science fiction that are a little twisty, things that make you think, things that make you laugh a little bit. You know, it's not a humor story, but I did throw a few sort of jokes and stuff in there. I like to write funny if I can. Another piece uh, I did for a, uh, a fantasy series that was more straight up humor that was called I'm with the Bard. It was for uh, was it Magic and, and Monster in Laws, an anthology. And so that was nice. But this is more of a drama, I would guess, a sci-fi story. Not as funny, but you know, still do what you can. <laughs> so then what is the most misunderstood aspect of sci-fi that maybe people who don't follow it understand? Let me think, the most misunderstood aspect. One thing I think that people who do follow sci-fi know more than people who maybe don't engage with it at all is that science fiction, I like to see it as less of a specific genre and more of a setting or platform for telling different kinds of stories. So for example, Awakening, it uses Star Trek conventions. When you read the first few pages, you recognize what's going on. This is a ship. They've all got, you know, sort of there's the captain. They've all got different color shirts that indicate either, you know, positions or ranks or whatever. It's using it as a shorthand for saying, here's a scenario. You don't have to figure out too much about the scenario because you already kind of know it. Now we're going to use that to go to the interesting thing, uh, which is, you know, without spoiling, you know, any more of the story, you'll have to read it to figure out what the interesting thing is here. But I think of science fiction as I think of many sort of genres. So, for example, let's take horror. Horror as a genre is someone starts out in a place that's usually sort of safe and they usually end in something that's terrifying and then you know if it's a tragedy everybody dies if it's one person lives you know then you have like the final girl or whomever lives and you can do that in science fiction and fantasy and contemporary stuff you could set a horror series and you know like uh, prehistoric days it doesn't need to even have humans it could just have a cat and a mouse you know you could have a straight up horror scene with anthropomorphic chair if you want or whatever like it's more the structure of the story and the kind of emotions that you're trying to evoke in it. For science fiction, I see that as being, because you can do anything, it can be as futuristic, it can be this utopian, like Star Trek often is, it can be fully dystopian, like much of science fiction is, it can be a society that is similar to a society that some elements are better than others, like The Expanse, I wouldn't say it's utopian or dystopian per se, things are good for some people, bad for other people. You can do a lot of different stuff and tell a lot of different stories in it, and I think that because it's kind of fantasy science fiction is just sort of fantasy without the magic in many cases you replace magic with technology and all of a sudden you get from you know like dc superheroes like shazam to iron man or something move from the 30s 40s to post second world war there's a shift in superheroes from sort of magical based to more science based and it's not all but you know maybe it just says a lot about you know what stan lee was thinking about you know circa like 1960 there's a reason why marvel heroes tend to be a little different than some of the older like the specter or something like that you know which is like the judgment of god so i don't think you need science fiction per se or anything sciencey to tell whatever kind of story you're doing but i do think it lends naturally to some other stories and i guess that's one reason i like star trek so much is because i originally watched star trek the next generation growing up yeah. in the 90s that was the most interesting to me because it dealt with moral issues I mean, either Star Trek's all do, but this is the one I saw that dealt with it. I thought very well. That's what I love about science fiction is, you know, you can construct situations, you know, 50 minutes into the future, into thousands of years into the future, but they still deal with the same moral quandaries and, you know, what do we do? How should we deal with the prime directive in Star Trek is the classic thing, right? You know, you go to a planet, they're not quite as developed enough as to, you know, meet your criteria for letting them into Starfleet or, you know, telling them about the Federation or anything like that. So what do you do? Do you help them? Do you not help them? What happens if somebody stumbles on the planet and accidentally makes contact? How do you engage in other societies in a way to, you know, let them naturally develop, but sometimes you might have to step in or sometimes you feel like you have to step in, but you shouldn't because it's not your place. And those are interesting moral questions to me. And I feel like sci-fi does a very good job of asking them. And Star Trek in particular, for me, that's the, the heart of it, as opposed to something like The Expanse, 
which is sort of more like mass effect, you know, what is the, the right thing to do, the, the good of the many, the good. It does we deal with more questions, but I guess it's a, a different sort of, it feels different. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. In terms of being a creative person, what is your creative kryptonite? There's two ways to look at that question. One, I think, is the thing that hampers my creativity, and the other is the thing that would hamper my ability to do the actual act of creation. Uh, the latter would be just like hours in the day dealing, you know, finding the right artist. That's for another series that I'm working on. It took a long time for me to find the artist for it, and I did, and I'm happy. But months of like thinking about it and asking around and seeing people's work were like, you're great, but you're not right for this specific series. Or you're great, but unfortunately, that's just beyond my budget at the time for this particular thing. In terms of coming up with, I actually have no problem coming up with stories or ideas. I have way too many. I've got a long list of like, cool series that I think would be neat to write. It's more just a question of prioritizing and deciding what is going to be the most interesting thing for me to write and also for other people. What I've been trying to do is I've been trying to not sort of write the same type of story or the same type of genre to sort of be loose about things. At the same time, if I have three or four different things I'm writing and they all feel different, they all kind of taste a little different, then you can engage with those. And if you get bored of one, you can go on to the other. <laughs> I've been keeping myself sane with all this. It's like, you know, if you're just writing one thing, you're just doing that one thing. So you better want to do it all the time where that's not how humans are. Like we often want to do a few different things. So having a couple things on the go has been extremely helpful. Does writing energize you or does it drain you creatively? I say creatively, it does both. I've never heard of a writer who says all they want to do is write and they just uniformly get happiness out of the act of writing. Like there's the sort of stereotype that writers are all miserable people inside and that they hate writing, but they love having written. It's the same thing like practicing an instrument. You know, you can practice piano. You can be like, okay, I'm going to like work on this particular piece. I'm going to work on this section of it. And you're going to be happy when it's done. But doing of it, sometimes you're happy doing it, but it's work. And the hardest part for me writing is not tooling around getting a sentence to be perfect because my impulse is to create a perfect page with perfect dialogue and then I move on to the next one, which is usually not that great for a first draft where you may like go back and change everything else. And I've spent like so long fine tuning a joke and then the second draft you realize there's no reason for that joke to be in there because like the whole scene's going to get cut, you know, like these people don't need to be speaking to each other. You figured out a better way to construct things, you know. So I, I do enjoy writing. It's an emotional roller coaster, you know, it's the frustration of I'll never get past this part to the joy of I finally got past this part and then that's just sine waves itself continuously until you've got a finished product <laughs> and then have to deal with getting someone else to you know make the vision be something like you've written and that's a whole other you know working with artistic partners that's the other side of the process which is uh, you know also extremely fun but also extremely taxing at times you know if you have someone else who's doing something that's just not what you want to do and you don't think that their way is better because often someone does something that's not what you want but they've done it in a way that's so good and so interesting and fresh that you're like this wasn't what I had in mind at all but good like this it gets that uh, the feel that I want you know even better than this the fact that I'm I'm still doing it compulsively. Probably more ups and downs on the whole. Speaking of your artists, at least for this series, and I'd love to have you back on to talk about your other works as well too, but you know, we're, we're only focused on Awakening for now, which is, who is the artist you chose and what was the first piece of artwork that you got back from this script that was better than what appeared on the page? So the artist I chose, Ray Warrenchuk, who's out of uh, Ottawa. He's a very talented uh, artist. Very quickly into the conversations with artists when I was looking around, he seemed like just nice, friendly, responsive. That goes so far. Even if you have mediocre artists, and I'm not suggesting he is one, but if you were to have a mediocre artist, but a person who's excellent to work with, you know, and is nice and is affordable, like that's better than having someone who's like a phenomenal artist, but impossible to work with and doesn't meet deadlines and pulling teeth just to like get them to do anything. And I've learned this a bit. I've worked with some people who are harder to work with than others. And some people who've art, I was like, your art is amazing, man. Like you cannot meet a deadline. I can't work with you for anything but a small thing. This was fine, but if we have to do a series like that, I don't know about that, you know? So Greg is great. I would strongly recommend Greg to anyone who wants to work with him. And part of the Kickstarter campaign, I'll just mention that Greg is doing sketches for one of the tiers. I think it's the Admiral tier. I've named all the tiers after like Ensign, Lieutenant, Commander, Captain, Admiral, Founder. I might have missed one, but I think that's it. He'll do these amazing sketches as well. He has one of me draped around the legs of uh, Commander Goldhawk, uh, who's sort of our kind of 
Klingon-ish like tough uh, security officer on the ship, which is uh, an accurate representation of how I feel to her, I would say. <laughs> She's one of my favorite characters to write. So then what was the scene that he created that was better than what you had written down on the page? Oh, the anomaly. The splash that you have down there with the ship just seeing this swirling mass of stuff. It's incomprehensible. The colorist did a lot for that as well. The coloring behind it, the swirling confusion of mesh mash of colors uh, really works very well. You know, I think we started in the first page, the first two pages. You know, it took a bit to get the characters right. Once he got Lieutenant Lau, this guy, the main guy, that was like the first page he had with him like staring at you with like the eyes, which is the like the banner, I think, for my Twitter. And uh, it's an image I share a lot for this Kickstarter account. Campaign. Right there, I was like, okay, he's getting it. He knows what I'm doing. And finally, once he drew the ship in front of the anomaly on the spread, I was like, okay, this is good. This is exactly what I want. And we don't have too many exterior shots. It mostly takes place inside the ship. So he has to get the characters just right. And I feel some of them we figured out right away. A couple took a, a few iterations. We got there and he was extremely great to work with the entire way of getting there. Not like pulling teeth to be like, can you do this? Can you do this? I'm like, this needs to be a little more like this. And he's like, I got it. Let me figure it out. You know, and then it all works out. Before I get into my introspective questions, is there anything I haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? Right now, the only thing I'm showcasing and telling people to do is back awakening on Kickstarter. That is my one message for February. I'm keeping it tight this month. If you like Star Trek, if you like science fiction, if you like anything that makes you think and makes you smile, I really think you'll like this comic. It's got trading cards in the back, which is something that we might uh, discuss later. I have a deep love of, of character-based trading cards, and so I made eight of them for this. They're all getting released as milestone markers for supporting the campaign, and I'm going to release them as a part of this uh, comic as well. If we meet our funding goal and exceed it, if we hit any stretch goals, then I might print a few of those out and throw them in with people's orders so are we going to see a collectible trading card game possibly in the future or maybe a tabletop version of this if someone wants to do that <laughs> i have designed a few games in the past oh. different board games that i've had passes at but i've never taken the time to take them further than just play testing amongst my friends so i do have that also <laughs> kicking around the brain these aren't pokemon stuff these are more like the old Marvel and DC cards oh, from yeah. like the 90s that have like character descriptions in the back and it's just basically an excuse to write like an extra largely funny thing I try to keep them a little light a little you know like go back to them in their college days that kind of thing you know, one of the characters uh, Gold Talk the security officer I talk how she was uh, I mentioned how she was recruited to uh the confederation on like a, essentially a sports scholarship and kicked out after beating up a ref like you know that kind of so it's just fun yeah so then who, who are some of your other characters of, of this crew that we can follow in this short one shot sure uh, so i tried to keep this fairly tight i've got six characters in the entire crew and they're all on the cover which is uh, nice and if you're just looking at the cover you're like oh there they are lieutenant lao is the navigator he's the first one we see and he's the one who uh, who appears affected and something's going on with him and the rest of the story is trying to figure out what that is and what to do about it. We've got this uh, sort of aquatic blue character, Navani, who's the Starship's medical officer. Her and Lau have a bit of history, and that was nice, being able to have someone who I can have the main character have a relationship with, not necessarily a romantic relationship, but with a personal history relationship with the other characters. And a lot of this is pulling from sort of very, you know, Star Trek-y tropes. We have the brainy science officer. We've got, you know, the tough security officer. The science officer is Vikenda. The security officer is Gold Talk. They all look different colors as well, so that's easy for you to track them. We've got the captain who wears a little a captain hat, a little sailor hat, and has got a stripe across. The cool thing about the captain, or the not cool thing, about the captain depending what you think is the captain is just called the captain i never came up with the name for the captain so part of what i'm doing with the campaign is at the end of it anyone who backs it can submit a name for the captain put that on the trading card uh, i'll pick one i like if there's a few that i like i'll i'll pick randomly out of like the top ones because i never got a name for the, everyone just calls calls the captain the captain so i was like you know i'll stick with that my editor was like are you sure you don't want to name him and i'm just like i do but i don't know what name i want to name him which is funny because I usually don't have an issue with names. They usually just kind of come to me. But I was like, you know what? Let's make this a fun thing for the campaign. Anyone who backs it will have a chance. Give people a chance to be a little interactive. And finally, there's the engineering officer who we don't know too much about. You'll see. <laughs> How to leave on a cliffhanger. Love that. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? It's an interesting 
uh, question. I think very early on. So I'm from uh, I'm from Montreal originally. I'm an English Montreal or an Anglo. The political context of my upbringing was the second Quebec referendum, 1995, October 30th, in which basically 50% plus a handful, 50.5 or something like that, people voted to remain inside Canada, where 49 and change voted to have Quebec separate and form an independent country, or as the question was worded, something very vague, maybe it'll be independent, maybe it won't, who knows. I didn't expect to get asked this question, but if I did, I would have the referendum question in front of me. It was one of those things phrased as, do you wish to separate from Canada, but maybe also have a trade negotiation and we can enter into some kind of discussion about it. But the results, if the referendum had gone, yes, everyone, Shane Bouchard wasn't like quite as much on this, but Perizo was definitely, this is getting deep cut Canadian politics for people who don't know. But the question was kind of wishy-washy, but the sentiment was like, do you want to be a separate country or not? And a lot of the people at the time we're voting yes, we're like, yeah, we basically want to have essentially more more bargaining rights. It's kind of like strike vote, you know, to have more rights, for, especially the French, the Quebecois who are voting for it, you know, more like local language rights, more, you know, independence, but not necessarily sovereignty or a separate country. So the language of that was politically crafted to be appealing to people who didn't want to be like, I just want to have a separate country. Despite the fact that like the person who was doing the referendum at the time, the Premier of Quebec, Jacques Perry, so wanted to have a separate country, yeah. was very clear about that. And everything after the fact pointed to if he got his way like that is exactly what he would be driving towards not some sort of let's just kind of discuss the role of Quebec within Canada which was more kind of how it was being built I mean forget the like whole English French language power thing in Quebec which is a whole other I mean it's obviously related but the idea that you could phrase things a certain way and then get people to agree with you or not and have huge political ramifications based on the fact that you know you're being maybe a little more wishy-washy about it and that was one of my first I think like political eye openings to being just like How you phrase things matters a lot. The words that you use, the way that people were compelled to want to vote one way or another. You know, a lot of nationalist rhetoric, Canadian nationalist rhetoric on the no side, sort of Quebec-specific nationalist rhetoric on the yes side. But the actual practical arguments of like, do you think a separate country in the middle of another country is a good idea? None of that was really being debated as much as like, do you want the dream? Or, you know, do you fear the dream? Which was interesting. I like to take a very practical approach to being like, okay, I try to view every question almost as a technical question, like what are the results of saying yes or no to this? What are the results of like looking down these things and explore the options, like very analytical. And I'm sort of, I'm a trained like philosopher and scientist. So like everything I ask tries to be like very like, okay, so what does this mean? And what are the consequences of doing something? But that's not how most people think. Most people they think with their heart, they vote with their hopes and their fears rather than dispassionate rational analysis of like policy. Like no one cares about policy at the end of the day. They care about if the person in power or the person was on their team or the other person's team. And that's something that I picked up pretty quickly on, at least in a in my particular Montreal English climate. But of course, that is completely true regardless of where you are, seeing how politics has developed since the 90s, especially at least in an American context, which is like more polarized. Mm-hmm. You know, you really see that listen about trying to lay a rational argument for something. It's usually about trying to get someone on your side and against the other person's side, whatever your issue is. That's more about me than you probably want to know. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Interesting. I'd say in terms of comics and just sort of creativity, I'll just cite my, the most influential comic writer. There are so many amazing comic writers. Like I, if I just started listing them, I would be here forever. Uh, the ones working today that I tend to read the most are you know, Tom King, Tom Taylor, uh, Rick Reminder, James Tunyon IV, uh, Scott Snyder, whose class I'm in. I mean, I, I feel silly just even trying to name the names because if I were looking at them, I'd be like, you, 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 you. Like there's so many good people. Mark Wade, but the one comic writer I think who would be the most influential in my writing in general would probably be Will Eisner. Will Eisner, of course, people know him for the spirit, for writing A Contract with God, arguably the first graphic novel, certainly the first thing that's popularly described as being a graphic novel, which is like phenomenal. As a person who's just like trying to see how you tell a story visually, A Contract with God is mind-blowingly good. As a person who I'm Jewish and as a person who, if you say, give me something that explains Judaism, just one thing, I would recommend them A Contract with God. It is like just the most emotional, in-depth description 
description of just like what it means uh, to be Jewish and just like Will Eisner stuff with the spirit, which I've only been discovering the past couple of years or so, you know, he's much old, you know, like in, from the forties and stuff, just so much fun, so much energy. He's almost got that, like that kind of Stan Lee feel, high hijinks, you know, jokes and stuff like way before Stan, of course, you know, everyone's drawing on everybody. So, you know, it's not like <laughs> Stan Lee has a Will Eisner feel, you know, probably is more the best way to describe it. There's so many amazing people who've done comics. He's just one I would rock. I mean, Neil Gaiman, of course. I'll stop with that as one introspective person. From a professional standpoint, you've created eight plus comics. You are creating many more that we haven't had a chance to talk on. And I look forward to seeing how your career unfolds in the future from your amazing creativity that you've shown thus far. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I consider myself successful for where I want to be right now. I am a patient person when it comes to hobbies because I know that things take a long time. I know that if you want to play the piano and you've never played the piano before, you're not going to be an amazing piano player after two years. You know, like these things take a very long time to do well and get good at and, and comics is no different. I wanted to write different types of stories and different types of genres and I feel like already I've achieved that to a level. My next marker of success, I suppose the most immediate marker of success will be, does this Kickstarter campaign succeed? And if so, you know, do people enjoy it? But if nothing else, like I will have done a thing and then I will be able to move on to the next one. The writer Mark Bernardin, who has a, a podcast with Kevin Smith, Fat Man Beyond, the same the podcast, he has this quote, I think done is the engine of more. And I 100% ascribe to that. You do a thing, that means you can do another thing. You do another thing, you can do its sequel. You can do issue two. You can do a different series if you want. And so for me, success isn't about reaching a thing that you want to reach and staying there. It's about understanding where you are in your professional development trajectory and being happy that you're moving in the right direction. The things that you have done so far, even if they weren't as much of a success as you would want them to be, if they're not as popular, let's say, they're creatively success, that there's something that you feel proud of. Everyone's got regrets for everything you've written, every panel, maybe you want to be a little different in hindsight, whatever. If you're happy you've done it, you want to do the next thing, that for me is success. It's about the process rather than the end state because there is no end state. The end state is you just keep writing until you die, you know, or like you just keep making things until you decide that you want to maybe do something else. That's also an option, which I don't think will be for me. I imagine I'm doing comics till I'm in the ground. I've just kind of made that decision a couple of years ago and the amount of effort I've put into it so far is not, uh, it does not suggest that I'd be stopping anytime soon. So yeah, I call myself successful, but my measure of success is just are you going the right direction and are you where you think you can be for whatever stage you're at? The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? So fortunately, I haven't had too many abject failures in comics. I think the first thing to do is realize when something is going to be problematic or is going to be a failure and then deciding very quickly how you want to address that before it becomes a bigger issue. So for example, one of the comics that I did, I, I won't say which one, I was working with an artist and after the character designs came in, I was like, maybe, but let me see page one. After page one came in, I was like, I don't know if this is right. The art style is just not what I'm looking for for this. The quality for this particular art style like is just not there. And then page two came in and I was like, I can't, no, like we're just this, I can't do this. And so I, you know, told the artist like, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Like I paid him for all the pages and I just moved on to somebody else. So I was like, this is okay to accept that someone it's not up to the task. It's not always a, you know, saying that the person is objectively bad. It's just that what they're trying to do does not go for this particular story. The feel isn't right. And to know that and then just move on quickly and not get stuck in the, you know, what am I going to do? It's like, you know what you're going to do. You're going to find someone else who's better for the task and then you're going to use them and then it's going to be good. Worst case scenario, like you might lose a bit of money. Ideally, you think about how to structure your contracts and how to pay people that, you know, you don't pay someone like every single thing before you even like see some of the finished product. And, you know, we both had a contract before that had an, like we had discussed it with the previous artists and this is something which I've now put in every contract, well, I don't know the right term, an escape clause, a uh, cancellation of contract clause, you know, and what happens if it gets canceled and so that, you know, in advance, everybody knows what the deal is if someone says this isn't going to work out. Uh, so move on quickly from failure. Don't dwell on it. It's very easy to take things that don't work personally, but everything is a learning experience, especially in the early stages of learning a new thing. I mean, it doesn't mean it stops being a learning experience later on. Definitely when you're starting, it's all a learning experience, you know, if you don't know it yet. Just don't get 
distraught and don't dwell. Even if you have a comic that's not great, that nobody sells, your comic gets canceled, do another thing. I know uh, Chip Zdarsky had his uh, Star-Lord. He was writing like Star-Lord, and by the time, I think he was like doing issue two was coming out, and they were already canning the series. So he went on did a, a bunch of other stuff, and I was writing like Daredevil and Batman. The fact that you something fails doesn't mean that you are a failure. That It just means that the thing didn't work for whatever reason. So figure out whatever reason. Sometimes you have control, sometimes you don't. And then just move on, because your goal, at least my goal, is to like write interesting stories that people like, that are emotionally resonant, that make you think, that make you laugh, as long as you're doing that, you're not failing. Maybe it's not how it turned out, but that's still okay. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. Whether it's as a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape, or form, you're inspiring them to be so. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Interesting question. I think inspiring is interesting because the question of historical influence, uh, and this is probably betraying more of my background as a guy who was a PhD in history and philosophy of science and technology. Historical influence isn't just the past influencing you. It's That's not where the action is happening. It's you looking to the past and choosing what things are influential. You know, we read lots of stuff. That doesn't mean that everything I read I take as an influence. The agency is really two ways. It's both in the things that you're writing and in the ways that people are looking. Uh, what they're looking for. And so I think in a lot of comics, the stuff that I write, I don't expect anyone to write the same as I write, because I don't expect anyone to write the same as anybody else writes. But the issues I hope to deal with, standard things that people deal with in fiction, you know, issues of like class, racism, sexism, social issues, labor issues, like this one series, like none of this is an awakening, by the way. Awakening is like a pure sci-fi, uh, kind of almost like utopian, you know, sort of world where like, these things don't really exists, but stuff that deals with, you know, more the real world or this series of God that's, you know, takes place in the 1920s, you know, the stuff is like very explicit. Those issues never go away. What I like to call like tragically evergreen issue of, you know, racism. If you want to write a comic about, you know, like structural racism or something, like that's not going to stop being relevant in 20 years. The way that people talk about it and the particular lens that people are looking at these issues will change. Rather, the way that I would like to ha be thought of, let's say, by the next generation, you know, after I've, you know, written my several, you know, magnum opi and people have read them and they're like, oh, this, this guy is very influential. Not to look at the exact way that I'm doing things and try to replicate it, but look at the questions I'm asking and maybe the way that I'm investigating the questions and think those are, are useful ways to investigate them. I'll just mention Gene Yang, I think, is one of the best writers about the difficulties of, I mean, he talks about race a lot. Like if you read like American Born Chinese, if you read Boxers and Saints, if you read Avatar, his Avatar comics are amazing because they deal with the complexities of cultural appropriation. People want to be like Aang, they get tattoos and Aang's like, you didn't earn your tattoos. Like you, you can't have them. And they're like, there's no other airbenders. There need to be more. And he's like, yeah, but you can't just say you're that, you know, like it deals with those in an interesting nuanced level where everyone's kind of trying to do good. Not everyone, but many people who are trying to do good can come into conflict with each other. Reading that, the thing I take away from him is like, you can have people who are trying to do good be at conflict with each other. You don't have people who are trying to be a jerk and trying to be good. He sets it up in that kind of way that I think is very interesting. The methods of exploring the issues, I think would be something that I hope other people take away from my writing only because I've <laughs> taken you know them away from somebody else's writing. Like it's just, a, it's a chain of influence. But like, like I said before, the agency does go both ways. You're writing something that someone will read and they'll get influenced by that, but they can read a bunch of things and they can also choose what resonates most deeply with them and which avenues of investigation they want to open up because they're most fruitful or they speak to with the issues that they're going through. If your life was a comic book or a series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? It's an interesting question. I think for a title, I would go with something, I don't know, maybe simple like searching. I think a lot of what I've done in my life has been doing things that interest me at the time without much consideration of if it's, is it going to be like the best thing for me years later down the road? Or like maybe I have an idea that it will be, but I'm less worried about the details just because I have the confidence that it'll all work out, which doesn't always. I mean, I spent a lot of time studying, you know, things that nobody cares about. I have a background, like I said, in history and philosophy of science. I've studied how scientific diagrams uh, enable people to reason about things they can't see or even barely understand. I didn't do that thinking that that's what I want to spend my whole life doing, but I was like, this is an interesting question to study, and I feel like it's good to look at now. I never ended up getting a job in academia for a number of uh, reasons. A lot of them found the reasons, like my wife had a job in Toronto. Uh, we have kids here. Well, I wasn't going to 
uproot everyone to a small town for no money for a crappy postdoc practical considerations so then you know i start searching for the next thing you know searching for different jobs searching for different creative pursuits once i find something i tend to get very into it which is you can probably tell you know like i've done like nine short comics in like the year i've started writing them or something like it's i get into stuff and i tend to stay with stuff as well a lot of music i spent years as a kid playing uh, piano and then saxophone for a decade and now I'm doing lots of jazz piano which has been just like just very satisfying to be able to to make music again at a level at least that, that I want to. We're only alive for a certain amount of time. If you're not doing something that you like then like what are you doing? Like unless you're doing something that you know will benefit let's say your kids or will benefit you in 10 years. Even the things that you're making sacrifices for if there's a version of that thing that you could do that's more enjoyable than the one you're already doing, then you should probably go do that. Get hit by a bus tomorrow, die of cancer in however many years. Like, you don't know. So you might as well just do the things you like and find a way to make whatever weird dreams you have a reality. I mean, my dreams were like, I just want to write comics because I love comics. As you can tell from, you know, my background here, like I I love comics. It's just, it's my preferred medium of choice. Better than TV or movies. Video games is maybe a close second, but that, that's a little different because it's an interactive thing rather than a story, just a story. Uh, right. The ones that are the best, of course, the ones that have the best story with the best interaction, you know. Some of the video, uh, there's also the arcade ones and like Cuphead or something, which like stories more the setting. Soundtrack's tough. I listened to a lot of jazz as a kid. I was like a nerdy ass, like Miles Davis, like John Coltrane, like Love and Aficionado. Like that's all I did is like I... I remember in like the late 90s, like downloading individual Miles Davis tracks from Napster, yeah. listening to them to make sure that they were good and were the ones they said they were, because that wasn't always the case, sure. combining them into albums and then burning them to CD so I could like listen to them in like a CD player somewhere. Like just ridiculous amount of effort <laughs> to like, you know, well, I could have bought a CD, but... <laughs> What's the fun? Of, what's the fun in that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I listen to a, a lot of jazz. I listen to a lot of metal growing up. Uh, I listen to like I strongly connect Tool, uh, Enema, uh, that album, with a very particular point in like my university days. These days, if I ever engage with linear algebra, in any reason, for some reason, Tool comes in my head because I studied for like a test back in the day for like three days straight. Let's say nothing but Tool. So like matrix normalization is like. Parker with a penis just kind of comes on like just instinctively. That's a tool track for those yeah. of you who don't know. <laughs> I listen to lots of music though. I mean, I don't tend to uh, to stick in in one genre because I tend to get into other things. These days, I'm playing. And this isn't actually the question of like what is a soundtrack <laughs> in my life. This yeah. is more just like what I do. But yeah. I have a binder of music I, I play largely on the piano, like just sort of jazz style variations of that. And about a third of it is video game music, a third of it is like anime or TV or film music, and the other third is jazz standards or pop songs that you just work out the progression to and just like, if you got a progression, you can figure out the melody, then you got the rest of the thing down. My soundtrack, if you were to just like pick like one track that like I would just sort of have on the back of my head at all time, the first theme to like Dr. Wily from Mega Man 2 or something that's just like some background video game music like you know maybe the moon theme from like uh ducktales like you know from all like nintendo stuff from like the nine just like the stuff that was in my head growing up that is never left my head and is sort of you know is something that gives you a sort of like drive and determination and keep moving forward you know sort of like a banging track to like whatever you're doing to keep you moving because yeah i mean just got to keep moving <laughs> Well, Ari, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely my pleasure. I had a great time today. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, when is the Kickstarter? So you can find me on Twitter at Ari B. Gross. You can email me directly at abgrss at gmail.com. I read all my emails. I will get back to everyone at some point, unless you are uh, emailing me terrible things, in which case I will ignore you because you're a jerk. Uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often. But go to my website at www.arigross.ca, A-R-I-G-R-O-S-S dot C-A. I strongly encourage everyone to sign up to my newsletter, which you'll find if you go to the website. I don't tend to spam people because that means I need to write more emails and I'm lazy. I only let you know when something interesting is happening. But that's how I let everyone know what's what's going on with me. And the Kickstarter campaign is running from February 1st to February 25th. I'm ending it on the 25th, which is my 40th birthday. My 40th birthday present to myself is not having to deal with Kickstarter after that day, except for fulfilling all the requirements, <laughs> which is still a lot of work, but that should be fun. 
You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 15 years, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.